Hey guys, welcome to the reaction video for Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Unfortunately, due to copyright reasons, I can't do this reaction the way I did for the first two movies, like I'm watching along with you and th for the first time, and then uh, I react to it, I give my opinions on it. I mean, that's more like a reaction video, but because the, whenever I upload that video, it gets blocked on YouTube, so I, I'm just gonna have to, you know, to do this in a different way and unfortunately I've already seen all these reactions uh, these videos before so it's hardly a fresh reaction I'm just gonna have to show you the picture and describe them to you and uh, tell you how it feels so basically this is not really a reaction video it's more like me talking about the deleted scenes of uh, Return of the Jedi which is still gonna be fun uh, okay let's talk about the first one it's called Vader's Arrival and Reaching Out to Luke so this uh, this began exactly how the movie began. Vader arrives uh, at the second Death Star, and he talks to this this guy. This what's his name? Admiral. I don't remember his name, but <laughs> uh, anyway, he promises to double up his efforts. You know how it goes. So basically, this uh, the first part of this video progresses exactly how you would expect, exactly as the movie went and they departed not amicably then vader interestingly gets into the elevator this is where the uh deleted part of the scene starts vader gets in the elevator goes through the corridor there's a black r2 unit over there and then okay he gets on the elevator and then he enters into a chamber of his own and i think it's like his meditation chamber or recuperation chamber it's the exact same thing from empire strikes back so either he had someone just uh, transfer that entire room to the, to the, to the new one to his new bedroom in uh death star 2 or he had someone build an, an exactly identical device I don't know, he's Darth Vader, he can probably do whatever the hell he wants. Uh, basically, he sits in this chamber and starts meditating and starts force calling out to Luke. Um, and you can imagine J James Earl Jones being like, Luke, Luke, join me in the dark side. My son, it is the only way. Um, very dramatic, like... And then the camera cuts to Luke in his uh, sh Jedi robes, face shrouded in darkness in the cave. And you probably know this scene because this is a really famous scene. It's been actually added back into the movie for a special version of it. Uh, but not in the most popular uh, special edition that we get to buy on Blu-ray today. And Anyway, you see him uh, tweaking his lightsaber and the lights go from i think red to green or so no from dark to uh basically the lights up and he test gives it a test run and it's a green saber you probably know this scene already we cut to the uh, uh, uh yes and then he turns on r2 he turn okay, cuts to the outside of the cave and uh, you can clearly see this is back on tattooing because the sand everywhere you know rough irritating gets everywhere uh 3po is staring at him. again he's complaining of course this 3po is always complaining he's complaining how desolate this place is uh i feel like there's a bit of a missed opportunity there like nobody is really acknowledging the fact that this is the they are all back to the planet where the adventure started on but no, they're making no comment on that and then R2 comes out and he seems to give 3PO the bad news that they are they will be going to Jabba's palace along. You can see the Falcon parked here along with Luke's X-Wing. And apparently 3PO didn't know that. So uh, he and he had to go along because it was Master Luke's orders. He expected Luke to go to the Jabba's palace and go get Han himself. And that did not happen because Luke had something else planned. So yeah, this would if this scene was back in the movie, it would add a lot of mystery to the beginning of it. And then the next, uh, the following scene is 
you know, you know this again. They are on their way to Jabba's palace, and the 3PO talks about how horrible that place is. And then the scene ends here. Uh, but yes, it is basically one big deleted scene sandwiched between two, uh, two of the uh, opening scenes in Return of the Jedi. It's really interesting. So, first of all, I just really like to point out that I don't know how often Vader does this because he just does, he, in this scene, he seems to be doing it for no reason. He just has a spare moment. He's already terrified of the, uh, the, the officer on Death Star. So he's, uh, Emperor is not here yet. So he's got a few hours of free time. Then he gets into his chamber and the force calls Luke. And the transition seems to suggest that Luke actually hears him. Um, but he really has nothing interesting to say. It's the uh, same old bullshit we already heard in Empire Strikes Back. Like, son, join me. We need to, we have cookies on the dark side. Come on, it's the only way you don't get cookies with rebels. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, it's so lame. <laughs> I'm sorry, Daddy Vader is just, he calling his son out of nowhere and has nothing really interesting to say is kind of adorable but lame and y you can imagine how irritating this must be for Luke especially if he has no control of this it's kind of like Rey and Kylo's force f face uh, just uh, force talking to each other and they can see each other sometimes they have no control over how it hap how and when it happens like Ray stumbling upon Kylo without his shirt on. I'm sure you remember that scene very vividly. And what if like Luke was just taking a shower or having dinner with Leia or just doing anything, uh, Jedi training or something, meditating, and suddenly all he can hear in his mind is, Luke, my son, join the dark side. I've been calling you all day. That's annoying. Like, Dad, come on, training here. <laughs> just is uh, kind of funny to think about and of course if this scene was added back to the movie uh, that would once again change how Luke would be introduced in a new Star Wars movie it's like George Lucas is always second guessing his uh, decisions on how to make Luke a, uh, how to introduce Luke but maybe this is not George's decision because he's not technically the director but we all know he's in charge so I don't know who's who to uh, credit or blame for, depending on your point of view, I guess, for this scene not being in here. But personally, I'm I'm kind of glad they cut this out, just because the eventual appearance of Luke was kind of awesome when you think about it, and very mysterious, even though it doesn't really make any sense. Uh, if, think back on how the movie pro progressed. We go to the Jabba's palace with 3PO and R2. Uh, we see Lando already there. Luke, was, Luke actually appeared, but only as a hologram message, right? He doesn't physically appear, so that doesn't count. Um, we all, then we saw Leia and the tree. Uh, well, we didn't know it was Leia at first, but uh, it was revealed that that was Bounty Hunter was Leia and she freed Han. They got captured again. So everybody was there in a palace, imprisoned or trapped. Nothing was accomplished. The whole party was complete except fucking Luke Skywalker. And it, it was at that point, I believe it was like 20 minutes into the movie, we f he finally showed up, just dressed in this exact outfit, but without the lightsaber. And he was doing this uh, Jedi, you know, s strangulation thing. And uh, for a moment, we uh, th th this, th this just tells us so many things like he was more accomplished in his Jedi arts he could control the force a whole lot better and he's a, more of a badass but he's also dangerously close to the dark side because he was doing what Darth Vader would usually do and we, even though he was saving these friends the, the, the motivation is good but the motivation is always good uh, so uh, for that sequence uh, you would notice he wasn't uh, carrying his lightsaber and uh, there, that would introduce uh, some mystery uh, as to whether or not he even still has a lightsaber because he lost the last one in the last part of the last movie. So maybe he just doesn't use a lightsaber in this movie. And I mean, that would be a bomber. I mean, uh, so 
what I'm essentially saying is the way the movie actually happened. Uh, the audiences are constantly dangled, and、um, just kept on the edge of their seat as to not just to what would happen, but as to what exactly,、uh, what kind of position is our protagonist in right now? Everything has a question mark over them. And only after my、uh, about thirty minutes in, we finally see Luke getting his lightsaber from R two, and he popped it up, and it's green. So that solidifies it. Yet he totally is a badass. He's got even a new lightsaber, and it's even a new color. I mean, at that time, I don't think people even knew lightsabers could be green yet. <laughs> so I really think the movie,、uh, the way the Return of the Jedi. Handle that part is just magical. Even though when you think back on it, like why did you make this so complicated? What was even the point if you just have to end up killing everybody anyway? But that's basically the、uh, first、uh, deleted scene of Return of the Jedi. I'm st- I'm talking about this for a way too long a time. Probably have to speed it up, but、uh, probably won't be able to. Anyway, let's go to the next one. Okay, the second scene we are going to be examining is called Tatooine Sandstorm. Now, this is a very interesting one. They're all kind of interesting, by the way. So it starts with the explosion of Jabba's、uh, ship, sand skitter. I don't know how you call that thing. <laughs> There are a lot of Star Wars jargons and, and、uh, just.、Uh, Phrases that I'm not entirely familiar with, even though I've read them like a million times. But after they escape, there's this little scene in the sandstorm where everybody tracks back to their ships, and it's they're totally struggling. And I don't know if I can pinpoint the exact picture, but yes,、uh, Lando here is using some kind of.、Uh, A、uh, homing beacon or location device. Anyway, he has to use that plus goggles plus all this stuff to be able to, to even be able to walk. And he's got the Wookie on his back. He basically is the pathfinder of the party, and he's using that to find the, the where the Falcon and the X-wing are parked because otherwise they would never find it. And in this this is this scene that you is clearly not、uh, audibly corrected because you can basically hear nothing except the very loud sandstorm sound effect. I mean that's not even sandstorm sound effect. I believe it. It's just a windpipe machine at, at the scene, at the studio, and you can you can you can just barely hear everybody talk, but they add this subtitle, so that's very considerate. Basically, Han says,、uh, "My mind, my eyes still don't work all that well. All I see is sand." But Leia says,、uh, "That's all any of us can see." So he's actually getting better. And they arrive at the ramp of the Falcon. Han、uh, turns around and asks Luke to join them on the Falcon and just ditch the X-wing here. And th- th- so they'll go back to the to the rebel fleet together. But Luke declines because he has a promise to keep to an old friend. As we know, that's Yoda. He gotta go back to finish his training. <laughs> And in fact, e- essentially, this scene doesn't tell us anything we don't already know. It's just a, some friendly exchanges between the party and some extremely. Friendly exchanges. Can I can I get to the、uh, one scene? Nope. Basically, look at Leia share a brief kiss again. But you know what? It, it, this this one is not passionate. It's more like brotherly sisterly, I guess. And、uh, Han is right here. If he's okay with it, I mean, I'm okay with it. Just I'm I'm done analyzing over the the the, bro- the sibling kiss thing. Uh, Han says, "I guess I owe you one now." I don't know. This part of the conversation has always been in my mind. I, I, I don't know. Is it even? Maybe it's actually in the final movie also, or have I just seen this scene before, or have I read this scene in the novelization before? Anyway, I've always just、uh, this conversation is not new to me. I've always kind of considered it that it has happened and it's canon. It's weird, but. Then it's decided that Luke would just、uh, 
walk along into the uh, uh, oblivion of the desert. This, just, you, know, you can't see where he's going. It's a very uh, strong imagery here. Like he's par uh, parting ways with the rest of his friends. I mean, that's always kind of be Luke's destiny. He has friends. He has people he can confide into. He even has a sister. But his path has always been alone, which... Even at the uh, end of this movie, we see everybody else celebrating. He's out there alone, somewhere else in the forest, They're burning his father's body. Nobody else was with him. And he, the movie ended with him looking at ghosts of uh, people that nobody else could see. So Luke's path has always been very lonely and is destined to be especially if he is the first of the new wave of Jedi so there's really nobody to share his burden and Leia probably just doesn't get to that level or she's way too occupied with other you know, other things in her life to actually commit to any force training Anyway, he gets to his X-Wing, he climbs up the ladder, he closes the hatch. I mean, and there's not even, this is like really crude way for a spacecraft to close its hatch. It's the whole uh, cockpit has to be so full of sand, it's gotta be annoying. But then they blast out of the atmosphere of Tatooine, and it's just like the movie, they promise to meet each other back in the fleet. Basically, that's this scene. Uh, this scene is definitely not necessary. It just doesn't tell us anything we don't already know. And uh, I don't think maybe they just decided that this perpetual sandstorm effect is not too good for the the movie because it's gonna keep the uh, visual very maintained for about three minutes. So they decided to cut it out. Anyway, it's nice to see it, but not necessary for the movie. I support the 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 deletion. Not that anybody needs my support for doing it. Anyway, next scene. Okay, next the scene called Rebel Raid on a Bunker Extended. Now this one, uh, I, there's very little to say about this one. It's, it's exactly as it is, the extended scene of the Bunker Raid. Uh, it's where Han, Leia, and a bunch of other rebel soldiers, they storm the uh, banker on the forest moon of Endor to uh, blow, uh, to set the, their charges and blow blow off the, uh, the, the, the station that generates the shield for the Death Star. I'm sure there's an easier way to say that. And they encounter a whole bunch of stormtroopers and there's a firefight. Uh, they didn't complete the laser effect, uh, the sound effect clearly has not been fixed. The only thing that seems to be legit in this scene is, uh, is the music. They uh, added some John Williams music in it, and, it's, and the music is just uh, struggling to make this look exciting. Basically, everybody runs around, the stormtroopers can't shoot for shit. Uh, and that's abundantly obvious even when there's no laser trajectory to judge that. Uh, and ends up with a whole pile of stormtrooper bodies on the floor. Their armor does nothing, and uh, one rebel died. I mean, yeah, you can't. You gotta kill somebody. You can't just tell me that, that no, not a single good guy died in this massive firefight. They arrive. Uh, <laughs> just check out this whole this this pile of stormtrooper bodies. This is fucking brutal. And yes, only one guy that they keep showing this. I think it's getting comical that they keep showing uh, how many st how st the stormtroopers troopers just the suck at their jobs. I guess maybe this is why they cut this part because it's getting ridiculous. And we get a closer look at well, at least one of these rebel soldiers is clearly carrying a lot of shit. And they open this door to uh, this is the door to an imperial station that they're working on I, I have no idea what exactly they're working on but it seems to be some important stuff uh, the Han forces the door open they get inside and they take these people under arrest and the next scene is again back to the actual movie this is uh, where 
this guy uh, shows up out of nowhere and Han throws this uh, thing at him and he falls over the edge with a Willem scream but everybody else pops up and it takes them uh, takes the uh, arrest the rebels again and this guy said uh, you rebel scum but there's one little piece of added stuff at the end where Han looks all indignant and, and says scum like are you calling me I think it's a callback to uh, all that uh, uh, nerf herder thing that Leia called scruffy look looking nerf herder thing because he seems to take notice of some uh, uh, name callings it's like uh, who's scruffy looking and he here he's like scum like uh, he, he's probably about to die and this is uh, and this is what he pays his attention to like uh, you gotta kill me with respect but <laughs> other than that this is a very there's not a whole lot to say about this I guess scum has been kind of glorified in Star Wars language especially uh, between the after the exchange between Phasma and Finn, Phasma's like uh, you'll always be scum and uh, Finn's like rebel scum so th I guess th uh, in our day and age the rebel scum has never been a better term and it's kind of funny that they're still trying to make it feel like it's a uh, anything it's a bad thing to call people because uh we uh we probably identify as rebel scum these days anyway that's uh that's it for this scene let's go for the next one now the last thing we're gonna see today is called Commander Jerjero's Conflict. I guess that's the name of the guy at the first video uh, that I forgot. His name is Jerjero. <laughs> I'm not sure why I forgot that name. Uh, the scene starts with a Vader approaching uh, the. Uh, th this is the uh, supposed to be the entrance to the Emperor's throne room, and Vader wants to enter, but Jerjero is standing guard here and. He seems to have grown some titanium balls uh, in between the scenes we've seen him. He actually points to Vader and says, you may not enter. And as you can predict, Vader is beginning to choke the life out of him. And then he says, it's the Emperor's wishes. Uh, we can see so, two of the uh, Royal Imperial Guards here actually raise their weapons. At least I think this is the weapon. It's, maybe it's just a walking stick or maybe it's a microphone. I don't know. At this point, I can't tell. Basically, uh, at least we see them attempt to do something. That's uh, that's more than I can ever say otherwise of them. Uh, but then Vader relinquishes and he decides to wait for Emperor's command. Because he's still kind of afraid of the Emperor. So Jujuro goes on the elevator to, I guess, ask the Emperor if he can be disturbed. By disturbing him, which is, I'm sure it's going to end very well. Then we cut... To what's really interesting is a entire, entirely uh, deleted subplot of the last act of the movie. So while all this is happening, uh, while Luke was like going through his, go, uh, contemplating whether he was going to get his lightsaber, we hear something akin to a telephone ring. And uh, at first, when I the first time I saw this thing, I kind of panicked, like, what the hell is going on? Is somebody? calling any of these as any of them gonna take a phone take uh do they have have they carried a cell phone to the death star is that even allowed <laughs> like but uh turns out it's the uh transmitter uh beeping from this room that, that it's next to the scene that they're calling to and uh, we have uh George Gerard here he's receiving order i guess it's supposed to be from the emperor because the voice used here is definitely not the uh, mcdermott's voice it's not the emperor's voice it's just some regular dude's voice so i i believe that's a standing voice standing for the emperor because jajara does call him your highness uh basically that voice uh, emperor is asking him to blow up the uh, the forest mode of endor uh, with the Death Star, Death Star beam, because apparently he's in control of that. I mean, that's not in the final movie, but it kind of makes sense that the Emperor would want to do something like that, especially as a threat to. Well, we'll consider it as a threat to Luke and his uh, and all the other rebels. Uh, he knows Luke has some friends on on Endor, but 
I don't know if it's wise to uh, start doing that at this stage because you know the that station is generating the shield for Death Star and taking out the planet would leave the Death Star vulnerable. I guess Emperor is that confident that even with the shield down, the uh, fleet would never stand a chance against his Imperial one. He would be wrong, but. I mean, let's let's imagine for a second that it does uh, destroy the first moon of Endor. I guess what would happen, really? I guess Han, Leia, Chewie, three PO, they all die. The the Rebel Battalion on that dies. Luke loses most of his friends, and but the shield is down for Death Star. So Lando in the Falcon and Wedge and the other uh, and the the, the other. Rebel fleet would still be able to do what they eventually did. They would be able to destroy the Death Star, and so what if, if I mean that's not a too big of a loss for the galaxy. If that's maybe too harsh to say, Luke would be devastated. He's probably gonna turn to the dark side. He's going to go full Vader mode. He's probably gonna kill Vader and uh, either kill Emperor or swear allegiance to him. It probably doesn't matter because the Death Star is about to go. I don't. I don't think anything happens in that throne room it would effectively change the fact that Lando is gonna blow the Death Star to bits. But anyway, in this scene, we can clearly see Jer Gerald hesitating to comply with this command, which is really interesting because uh, at the first scene we see Jer Gerald uh, when he's talking to Vader, he just seems like uh, any other regular frightened. Uh, Imperial officer, but in th this uh, protracted scene, we kind of can see while he does indeed comply with every command, he does have a mind of his own, and he's he's got more balls than we uh, th than we give him credit for. He retaliates uh, th by reminding the emperor that they do have troopers, they do have troops on the moon. They don't. He doesn't want to be the one to pull the trigger on his own people. Uh, but of course, the emperor is adamant in his uh, orders, and he decides to move the Death Star in place. Later, we see the scene continues with this part of the movie, and then cuts back here. Uh, and he, okay, so this part, the uh, his his P communication officer, I guess, tells him that they have lost contact with the uh, station on on. Uh, on the on the moon. So what I'm guessing happens is he uh, before he complied with the uh, destruction order, he asked of every personnel on the on Endor to uh, on the moon of Endor. This is confusing. Is the moon called Endor or is the big planet called Endor? But he asked everybody, every Imperial personnel on the moon on from that station to I guess pull off to escape first he gives him uh, some time to escape so he doesn't have to kill as many people as he needed to which is kind of i guess that's what happened that's not explicitly said but the fact that these guys have to tell him that they have lost contact with the station then he begins the uh, the order to move the death star death laser in place to destroy the moon that's kind of telling of his character And of course, uh, uh, we get later on. We go back to this scene again, and uh, we are at imminent firing point. The guy is uh, counting down to like zero point three, two, one, and we are the, the, we are ready to fire. We are ready to fire, sir. He has to remind him several times, and Gerald is kind of freezing here, just not wanting to give the order. Eventually, he gives the order to commence fire, and the scene ends. So of course, obviously, he never gets to actually fire the laser. I guess this added a, an extra layer of tension to the uh, final Death Star run because if Lando had destroyed the Death Star one second too late, we would uh, this everybody on the moon uh, would be obliterated. But we should not forget that had this guy been just a regular drone kind of officer and and uh, follows orders without any question. He, he probably would have uh, used the Death Star to destroy the moon a lot, a lot sooner. So, I guess we should give him some due credits and the credits that I've never given him before because I didn't actually know him before. So yeah, this is a, this is a really interesting bit of extra knowledge, uh, for the ending of Return of the Jedi, and I'm really glad I knew it now. 
So that's all for the deleted scenes of Return of the Jedi. Um, more deleted scenes for Star Wars movies to come, prequels next. But I'm not sure at, at up to this point if I'm going to be able to do a regular reaction video or I have to do this description type like this. So we're just gonna have to see. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you for the deleted scenes of uh, the Phantom Menace. Bye bye.